Hey guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian McCollum, and today I just want to take a minute to appreciate the skill that is required to make a semi-automatic shotgun actually work reliably. There are so many things working against a semi-auto shotgun. There are so many things that are so much more difficult in making a semi-auto shotgun than any other sort of self-loading firearm that... I, and I don't think people give full appreciation to to all of these factors. So fundamentally, we're going to talk about the shot, the 12 gauge shell today, but all of the different shotgun shells have the same fundamental uh, problems. They are essentially terrible designs to work with for semi-auto guns. These are, this is a cartridge style that was designed for a single shot gun, essentially, or a break open gun, where all you have to do is take shell and put it in from the back of the gun by hand, and it works. And when you're done, you break it open and the shell comes out the back again like it went in. Easy. Really is easy. And it's not a bad design for that. Uh, notable features here, we have a rimmed case, which Again, for the, the guns these were originally designed for, rimmed case is great. It makes head spacing very easy. It means you can have different lengths of cartridge without having to worry about how they're going to head space. They're all just going to head space on the rim. Problem solved. You get to a self-loading gun where there has to be some sort of mechanism to take that shell from a storage device and then move it up into a chamber. Now, all of a sudden, differences in overall length are a huge problem. You have this protruding rim that means it's very hard to stack the cartridges one on top of another. And shotguns, especially 12 gauge, and then also 20 and 410, and then you really kind of get into the weeds of cartridges that aren't particularly popular, but the 12 gauge cartridge has so much history to it. There are so many guns out there uh, chambered for it, and so many different ammunition manufacturers that it, it's essentially impossible to modernize the shotgun shell, because there, there would be far better ways to design a shotgun shell for a modern semi-automatic shotgun. Say, even if you just replaced it with a standard, like a, a full-length brass case that was really easy to get an exact length on, with a uh, some sort of head spacing on the, the front of the case, you could have it be rimless then, and it would feed so much better out of so many different guns. But you can't, because we have these legacy shells and legacy guns, millions upon millions of legacy guns, that mean the old original ammo is never going to go anywhere. Now, the one element that shotgun designers have working in their favor is the fact that the 12 gauge is a relatively low pressure cartridge. This isn't, you know, some ultra magnum rifle cartridge. It's large diameter, there's a lot of volume, which means uh, you have a, a large initial expansion area before pressure starts to build up in the cartridge, uh, which means most shotguns have a single asymmetric locking lug. They're kind of not that much different from designing a black powder single shot rifle locking system. They use, for those things, they would always just essentially use the stem of the bolt handle, and that worked fine. Shotguns typically have a single locking lug, usually coming up out of the top of the bolt, and that works fine. That's easy. But that's where the easy ends. Now you get into the shell itself. Not only is it of questionable length, in fact there are different lengths, literal different lengths that are available commercially that people expect usually to be able to interchange in guns, you have essentially a wad cutter cartridge. If you think about a normal uh, any other sort of rifle or pistol ammunition, you typically have a reasonably pointed bullet. And so as long as you get the bullet somewhere into the chamber, it will, it will feed itself into the chamber. It'll fix any positioning errors as it feeds in. A shotgun shell is flat on its face like a wad cutter, and if it doesn't feed quite right, it will jam very easily. So that's that's one of the reasons that you tend to see lifters, because that shotgun lifter uh, mechanism allows the shell to be positioned in a way that it's most likely to get into the chamber without jamming. It's hard to do with box magazines though, which is part of the reason we rarely... there aren't that many shotguns out there with box magazines, and the ones that are always have, have issues with reliability. Sometimes most of them will work, but it's always one of the weak points of box-fed shotguns is the box magazines are, are the hardest part to get right. 
because they have to feed this flat-faced, cylindrical, essentially large wad cutter projectile into a chamber. Now, that low pressure that we talked about a minute ago is generally a good thing, but it also leads to some problems, because, as I implied, there is a wide range of, of ammunition that people expect to interchange in a shotgun. Just, like, I pulled out a couple of boxes I happen to have, and they run everything from uh, rubber buckshot, which weighs next to nothing and is going slow enough to be typically not lethal, to just generic birdshot practice loads to full power slugs. Uh, in fact, I, I did a couple of, uh, ran some numbers on a couple of shells. Uh, a light, just like a, a light target load of number eight birdshot used for practice or shooting at clays is going to be throwing 492 grains of pellets at 1145 feet per second. That's the light load. That gives you 1432 foot pounds of energy. And for you metric folks, don't worry about it. These exact numbers don't matter. Because the alternative is, let's say you want to run a three inch magnum shell of double out buckshot. That's going to be throwing 807 grains, so 80% more weight at 1,210 feet per second, giving you 2,623 foot-pounds of energy, nearly double the energy between these two cartridges that people, again, expect both to work one after the other in, in this shotgun. Consider the difficulties that you see with, for example, just the AR-15. When they went and started making carbine, short carbine versions of the AR-15, because the barrel was getting shorter, the gas port had to move back. And just the movement of the gas block a couple inches on the barrel, with the ammunition staying the same, caused problems. This, this required a lot of engineering work to try and perfect how exactly do we balance buffer weights and gas port sizes to make these guns reliable just having moved the gas block. Well, imagine that some of your 5.56 ammo was literally double the muzzle energy of some of your other uh, 5.56 ammo. In fact, if you're looking for not specifically bullet uh, projectile weight, but just muzzle energy, like a regular 12 gauge standard slug like this is going to be a little bit lighter than your birdshot load. You're looking at a one ounce slug that's 437 grains, but it's going at 1,850 feet per second, giving you 3,320 foot-pounds of energy. That's like 150 percent more than you're getting with these guys. So there have been a bunch, basically every firearm action system that's ever been designed has been adapted to shotguns, and most of them have been done successfully, which is quite remarkable. We have long recoil shotguns, we have short recoil shotguns, we have inertially operated shotguns. Benelli is famous for having an inertial system, although there are others, like the Shogren. Um, I mean, the, the first successful one to become really massively popular was a long recoil gun, the Browning Auto 5. Uh, we have gas-operated shotguns. Uh, I know that, that Franke is a long-stroke gas-operated shotgun. I'm sure there are short-stroke ones, although I can't think of any off the top of my head. But essentially every type of action that people can think of, they've tried to apply to 12 gauges, and they usually work. What you will see, though, are some situations where it'll work, but you have to adjust something on the gun depending on what you're doing. So with the Browning Auto 5, there's a, a friction system in the gun, and in order to switch from light loads to heavy loads, you have to actually change the configuration of the gun internally. With that Franke, it doesn't run on light birdshot like this. The gas system is set up to be better capable of handling full power ammo than light, and so the workaround was they just put a pump action mode on it as a, a backup, so that if you have ammo, in particular, because it's intended as a police, originally as a police gun. If you have something like rubber buckshot that is going to be extremely lightly loaded, well, then you can just run it as a pump action. At any rate, I think a lot of this is part of the reason why we have such popularity in pump action shotguns still today. Uh, there aren't a lot of people out there. Well, you would think that uh, we'd have figured out semi auto shotguns really well by now. They've been around for 125 years at this point. Uh, and yet, the fundamental issues in shotgun ammunition create such engineering challenges that, for a lot of people, the cost required to make a really reliable, excellent 
semi-auto shotgun is still high enough that they'd rather just get a bolt act or a uh, pump action. Anyway, uh, just a topic that came up today while I was playing around with the, the Franke. Hopefully you guys enjoyed it. Thanks for watching.